the banquet. On the king's return to Horton Tower, orders were given by Sir Richard for the immediate service of the banquet, it being the hospitable baronet's desire that festivities should succeed each other so rapidly as to allow of no tedium. The coup de seal of the banquet hall on the monarch's entrance was magnificent, panelled with black lustrous oak and lighted by mullioned windows, filled with stained glass and emblazoned with the armorial bearings of the family. The vast and lofty hall was hung with banners and decorated with panellies and trophies of chase. Three long tables ran down it, each containing hundred covers. At the lower end were stationed the heralds, the pursuivants, and the band of yeomen of the guard with the royal badge, a demi rose crown impaled with a demi thistle woven in gold on the doublets, and having fringed pole axes over their shoulders. Behind them was a richly carved oak screen concealing the passages leading to the buttery and the kitchens, in which the clerk of the kitchen, the handlers, and the yeomen of the cellar and the eowere were hurrying to and fro. Above the screen was the gallery tied by the frontiers and the minstrels, and over all was a noble rafter roof. The tables were profusely spread and glittered with silver dishes of extraordinary size and splendour, as well as with wagons and goblets of the same material and a rare design. The guests, all of whom were assembled, were outnumbered by the prodigious array of serving men, pages and yeomen waiters in the yellow and red liveries of the steward. Flourishes of trumpets announced the coming of the monarch, who was preceded by Sir Richard Horton, bearing a white one and ushered with much ceremony to his place. At the upper end of the hall was a raised floor, and on either side of it an oriel window, glowing with painted glass. On this day, the king's table was placed underneath a canopy of state, embroidered with the royal arms and bearing James's kindly motto, the 80 Pacifici. Seats were reserved at it for the Duke of Buckingham and Richmond, the Earls of Pembroke and Nottingham, the Lords Howard of Effingham and Grey of Robert, Sir Gilbert Porter and Bishop of Chester. These constituted favourite guests, grace having been said by the bishop of Orkney to their seats and the general stillness hitherto prevailing throughout the vast hall was broken instantaneously by the clatter of the trenches. A famous feast it was, and worthy of commemoration. Master Morris and Miller, two cults who contrived it, as well as the labourers for the rangers, for the passes, for the boiled meats, and for the bullets, formed their respective hearts to admiration. The result was all that could be desired. The fare was solid and substantial, consisting of dishes which could come to the end. Amongst the roast meats were chines of beef, haunches of venison, tickets of mutton, and fatty on turkeys and sucking pigs. Amongst the boiled pullets, lamb and veal, baked meats chiefly abounded, and amongst them were to be found red ear, pasta, hare pie, gammon of baked pie, and baked wild boar. With the salads, which were nothing more than what would nowadays be termed vegetables, were mixed all kinds of sour fish, arranged according to the steward's directions. The salads spread about the table, the fricassees mixed with them, the boiled meats among the fricassees, roast meats amongst the boiled, baked meats amongst Roast and carbonados amongst the ladies. This was the first course meal. In the second were all kinds of game and wild fowl, roast herons, green dish, bitten screens, bustards, curly, dotty relics, and hewits. Beside these there were mumbo pies, marrow pies, quince pies, artichoke pies, long times, and innumerable other things. Some dishes were especially reserved for the king's table as a baked swan, a roast peacock, and the jowl of a surgeon. South these and the piece of roast he formed the principal dishes. The attendants at the royal table comprised such gentlemen as wore Sir Richard Horton's liveries, and amongst these, of course, were Nicholas Ashton and Sherborne. On seeing the former, the king immediately inquired about his deliverer, and on hearing he was at the lower table, desired he might be sent for, and as Richard soon afterwards appeared, having on his return from the chase changed his sombre apparel or gayer attire, James smiled graciously upon him, and more than once, as a mark of a special favour, took the wine cup from his hands. The king did ample justice to the good things before him, and especially to be which he found so excellent that the carver had to help him for the second time. Sir Richard Horton ventured to express his gratification that his majesty found them good. Indeed, it is generally added, he said, that our Lancashire bee is well fed and well flavoured. Well flavoured, exclaimed James, as he swallowed the last juicy morsel. It is delicious, fine of beef no man ever will keep into, and I only wish all my loving suggests had as good a dinner as I have this day eaten. What joined you? Your cat is served, Richard, he asked with eyes evidently twinkling to a pretty meditative jest. This dish, replied on board, somewhat surprised. This sire is a loin of beef. A loin, exclaimed James, taking the carving knife from the sewer. Who survived? By my faith, that is not title honourable in your joint so worthy. It wants a dig to him, he shall have it henceforth. He had a touch in the moon to whack a long blade as he placed the sword on the back of a knife, a pheasant, and henceforth it shall be served loin, and the sea can it say. Give me a cup of wine, my sir, 
which you actually turn all the nobles at the table laugh loudly at a monarch's guests and as it was soon passed down to those at the lower table the hall resounded with laughter in which pay and attendant of every rejoined to the great satisfaction of the good-natured originator of the merriment my dear dad and gossip appears in unwanted good spirits they observed the Duke of Buckingham and we good reason Steenie replied the king for we didn't mind when we have had better sport always excepting the boar hunt when he should have been repitted by the cursed creature's tusk but for this raw ladder he added pointing to Richard ye mourn see what can be done for him Steenie we mourn have him at court your majesty's wishes have only to be expressed to be fulfilled replied Buckingham somewhat dryly were I the lad I wouldn't have placed all the meekle dependence on the duke's promises remarked Archie Armstrong in a low tone to Nicholas has your subject made any further inquiries about the girls suspected of witchcraft inquired Buckingham renewing the conversation whist steeny whist cried James didna ye see her yourself this morning he added in a low tone I, I recollect ye weren't at the chase oh well I have conferred with her and I'm so perplexed in the matter she is a well bored lassie and as only I the realm and answers decorously and doubtfully to say her looks and manners are mightily in her favour then you mean to dismiss the matter without further investigation observed Bungham I always thought your majesty delighted to exercise your sagacity in detecting the illusion practised by Satan and his worshippers and so we do replied Jane bend your bonny head this way till we whisper in your ear we have a device for finding it all out we cannot fail and when you ken it you will afford your dear dad's wisdom and bit maestry over the hail science of king's craft how would your majesty would make me acquainted with this notable scheme replied Bungham with ill concealed contempt I might make it more certain of success nah nah we shanna let the cat out of the bag just yet turn the king we mean it as a surprise to you all then whatever be the result it is certain to answer the best intended sir the duke he wa he are ever skeptical seen it ever miss out in your own dear dad and gossip rejoined James but ye shall find we hanna earned the title of the British Solomon for nothing soon after this the king arose and was ushered to his apartment by sir Richard Horton the same ceremony as had been observed on the entrance he was followed by all the nobles and Nicholas and the others being released from their duties repaired to the lower end of the hall to dine the rebel was now sufficiently boisterous for as the dames had departed at the same time as the monarch all restraint was cast aside the wine upflowed freely and the rafters rang with laughter under ordinary circumstances Richard would have shrunk from such a scene but he had now a part to play and therefore essayed to laugh and guess and to appear as reckless as his neighbours he was glad however when the signal for general dispersion was given for though Sir Richard Horton was unwilling to sin his guests he was fearful if they sat too long over their wine some disturbances might ensue and indeed when the revellers came forth and dispersed within the base court their flushed cheeks loud voices and unsteady gaze showed that their quotations had already been deep enough meanwhile quite as much mirth was taking place out of doors as had occurred within the banqueting court as soon as the king sat down to dinner according to promise the gates were thrown open and the crowd outside admitted the huge roast was then taken down carved and distributed among them the only difficulty experience being in regard to trenches and various and extraordinary were the contrivances restored to to supply the deficiency this circumstance however served to heighten the one and as several casts of stout ale were broached at the same time universal hilarity prevailed still in the midst of so vast a concourse many component parts of which had now begun to experience the effects of the poison liquor some little manifestation of disorder might naturally be expected but all such was speedily quelled by the yeomen of the guard and other officials appointed for the purpose and amidst the uproar and confusion harmony generally prevailed while elbowing his way through the crowd Nicholas felt his sleeve look and turning perceived Nance River who assigned him to follow her and there was somewhat something in her manner that left him no alternative but compliance Nance passed on rapidly and entered the doorway of the building where it might be supposed that they would be free from interruption what do you want with me Nance asked the squire somewhat impatiently I must beg to observe that I cannot be troubled further on your account and I'm greatly afraid aspersions may be born on my character if I am seen talking with you a few words with me when I injure your character squire rejoined Nance and it's on your account and no on my own that I have brought you here and have important information to give you what when your say when I tell your that Jem device Elizabeth device and her daughter Janet are here are reading the mischief again your Richard Ashton and Alice the devil ejaculated Nicholas and you'll find it the devil I can promise you unless they're fancy frustrated said that can be easily done replied Nicholas I'll cause them to be arrested at once nah nah that can be rejoined that's you 
inside your time. What and allow such miscreants go at large and work any malice they please against me and my friend replied Nicholas. Show me where they are, Nats, or I must make you a prisoner. Nah, you winna do that, Squire, she replied in a tone of good humour defiance. You winna do it for two good reasons. First, because you be harming a friend who wants to serve you and will do so if you let her. And secondly, because if you were to raise a finger again against me, I deprive you of speech and motion. When the right moment comes, you shall strike, but it will not come yet. The fruit is not ripe enough to gather. I am as anxious as you can be that the whole of the empty fruit should be swept away, and it shan't be if you leave it to me. Well, I commit the matter entirely to you, said Nicholas. Apparently, it cannot be in better hands. But are you aware that Mr. Empty is a prisoner here in Porter Tower? He was taken this morning in part. I know it, replied that, and I know also why he went there, and it were my intention to have revealed his life design to you. However, it has been ordered differently, or in respect to others. Wait till I give you this signal. They are disguised, but even if you see them and recognize them, do not let it appear till I give the word, or you'll soil it. Your injunction shall be obeyed implicitly, and that's joint Nicholas. I have now perfect reliance upon you, but when shall I see you again? That depends upon the circumstances, she replied. Tonight, maybe, maybe tomorrow night. My plans may be guided by those others, but when next you see me, you win to us. And without waiting an answer, she rushed out of the doorway, and mingled with the crowd, was instantly lost to view. While Nicholas, full of the intelligence he had received, betook himself slowly to his lodgings. Scarcely were they gone when a door which had been standing ajar near them was opened wide, and disclosed the keen visage of Master Potts. Here's a pretty plot hatching, here's a nice discovery I have made, so liliquized the attorney. The whole MD family, with the exception of the whole which herself, whom my soul burnt on Pendle Hill, or at Horton Tower, this shall be made known to the king. I'll have Nicholas Asherton's arrest at once, and the woman with him, whom I recognise as Nance Redburn. It will be a wonderful straw, and will raise me highly in his majesty's estimation. Yet stay, will not this interfere with my other plans with Janet? Let me reflect. I must go cautiously to work. Besides, if I cause Nicholas to be arrested, Nance will escape, and then I shall have no clue to the others. No, no, I must watch Nicholas closely, and take upon myself all the credit of the discovery. Perhaps through Janet I may be able to take their disguises. At all events, I will keep a sharp lookout. Affairs are now drawing to a close, and I am only like a wary and experienced fowler to lay my neck cleverly to catch the whole covey. And with these ruminations, he likewise went off into the base court. The rest of the day was one round of festivity and enjoyment in which all classes participated. There were trials of skill and strength, running, wrestling, and crudgling the matches with an infinite variety of country games and shows. Towards five o'clock, a rush cart decked with flowers and ribbons, and best ridden by men bearing garlands, was drawn up under the central building of the tower, in the open window of which sat James, a well pleased spectator of the different pastimes going forward, and several lively dancers were executed by a troop of male and female Morris dancers, accompanied by a tabo and pipe. But though this show was sufficiently attractive, it lacked the spirit of that form at all, while the character of Maid Marion, which then found so charming a representative in Alison, was now personated by a man named Nicholas Ashton, who was amongst the bystanders, was not deceived. That man was Jem Device. Enraged by this discovery, the squire was about to seize the ruffian, but called to mind Nancy's counsel. He refrained, and Jem, if it indeed were he, retired with a largest bestowed by the royal hand as a reward for his uncouth gamble. The rush cart and Morris dancers having disappeared and were truly was exhibited called the fool and his five sons. The names of the awful offspring of the sapient sire being pickle, herring, blue paws, pepper paws, ginger paws, and jack all spice. The humour of this piece, though not particularly refined, seemed to be appreciated by the audience generally, as well as by the monarch who laughed heartily at his coarse buffoonery. Next followed the plough and the sword and the principal actors being a number of grotesque figures armed with swords, some of whom were your to a plough on which sat a piper playing lustily while dragging along. The plough was guided by a man clothed in a bear skin with a fur cap on his head and a long tail like that of a lion dangling behind him. In this first shoe personage, who was intended to represent the wood demon of Earth, Nicholas again detected Jem Device and again was strongly tempted to disobey Nancy's injunctions and denounce him. The ratter that he recognised in an attendant female in a fantastic dress the ruffian's mother, Elizabeth, but he once more desisted. As soon as the mummers arrived in front of the king, the dance began. With their swords held upright, the party took hands and wheeled rapidly round the plough, keeping time to a merry measure played by the piper, who was still maintaining his seat. Suddenly, the ring was enlarged double its former size, each man extending his sword to his neighbour, who took hold of the point, after which an hexagonal figure was formed, all the blades being brought together. The swords were then quickly withdrawn, flashing like sunbeams, and a force swear 
figure was presented, the dancers vaulting actively over each other's heads over variations so see did not necessarily to be specified, and the sword concluded by a general clashing of swords intended to represent a melee. Meanwhile, Nicholas had been joined by Richard Asherton, and the latter was not alone in detecting the two devices through their disguises. On making this discovery, he mentioned it to the squire and was surprised to find him already aware of circumstances, and not less astonished when he was advised to let them alone. The squire added he was unable at that time to give his reasons for such counsel, but being good and conclusive, Richard would be satisfied of their propriety hereafter. The young man, however, thought otherwise, and notwithstanding his relatives' attempt to dissuade him, announced his intention, causing the party to be arrested at once, and with his design, went in search of an officer of the guard that the capture might be effected without disturbance. But the throng was so close round the dancers that he could not pierce it, and being compelled to return and take another course, he got nearer to the mazy ring and was unceremoniously pushed aside by the numerous. At this moment, both his arms were forcibly grasped, and a deep voice on the right was saying, Here, meddle not with us, and we will not meddle with you. While similar counsel was given him in other equally menacing tones, though in a different way. On the left, Richard would have shaken off his assailants and seized them in his turn, but power to do so was wanting to him. For the moment, he was deprived of speech and motion, but while thus situated, he felt that the sapphire ring given him by the king was snatched from his finger by the first speaker, whom he knew to be Jen Device, while a fearful spell was muttered over him by Elizabeth. As this occurred at the time when the rattling of the swords engaged the whole attention of the spectators, no one noticed what was going forward except Nicholas, and before he could get to the young man, the two miscreants were gone, nor could anyone tell what had become of them. Have the wretches done that you were mischief? asked the squire in a low tone of Richard. They have stolen the king's ring, which I meant to use in Alice's VR, replied the young man, who by this time had recovered his speech. That is unlucky indeed, said Nicholas, but we can defeat any ill design they may intend by acquainting Sir John Finnick with the circumstances. Let them be, said a voice in his ear. The time is not yet come. The squire did not look around, for he well knew that caution proceeding from McNance Redfern, and accordingly he observed Richard tarry a while, and you will be amply at end. And with this assurance, the young man was fain to be content. Just then, a trumpet was sounded, and a herald stationed on the summit of the broad flight of steps leading to Great Hall, proclaimed in a loud voice that a tilting match was about to take place between Archie Armstrong, Jester to his most gracious majesty, and Davy Drone, the new, filled the same honourable office to his grace, the Duke of Buckingham, and that a pair of guilty old chopins would be the reward of the successful combatant. This announcement was received with cheers, and preparations were instantly made for the mock tourney. A large circle being formed by the yeomen of the guard, with an alley leading to it on either side. The two combatants mounted on gaudy caparisoned obioses, rode into the ring. Both were armed to the teeth, each having a dish colour brace around him in lay of a breastplate, a newly scored brass porringer on his head, a large pewter platter instead of a buckler, and a spit with a bung at point to prevent mischief in place of a lance. The duke's jester was an obese little fellow, and his appearance in his warlike gear was so eminently ridiculous that it provoked roars of laughter, while Archie was scarcely less ridiculous. After curveting around the arena in imitation of knights of chivalry and performing their careers, their prankers, their false trots, their smooth apples and canterbury cases, the two champions took opposition of the each other with difficulty as it seemed, remaining in their hoeing charges and awaiting the signal of attack given by Sir John Finnis, the judge of the tournament. This was not long delayed, and the liaises, Aula, being pronounced the Priox Cavaliers, started forward with so much fury and so little discretion that meeting our way with a tremendous shot and putting against each over like two rams, both were thrown violently backwards, exhibiting amid the shouts of the spectators, their heels no longer hidden by the trappings of their steeds kicking in the air, encumbered as they were some little time elapsed before they could regain their feet, and their lances having been removed in the meanwhile by order of Sir John Finnett as being weapons of too dangerous a description for such truculent combatants, they attacked each other with their broad laven daggers, dealing sounding blows upon helm, habergeon, and shield, but doing little personal mischief. The strife raged furiously for some time, and as the champions appeared pretty well matched, it was not easy to say how it would terminate, when the chance seemed to decide in favour of Davy Drummond, for in dealing a heavier blow than usual, Archie's dagger snapped in twain, leaving him at the mercy of his opponent. On this, the doughty Davy, crowing lustily like a chanting leer, called upon him to yield, but Archie was so rough at his misadventure that instead of complying, he sprang forward, and 
with a hilt of broken weapon dealt his elated opponent a severe blow on the side of the head, not only knocking off the horringer, but stretching him on the ground beside it. The punishment he had received was enough for poor David. He made no attempt to rise, and Archer, prowling in his turn, trampled on the body of his prostrate four, and then capering joyously around it, was declared it and received the guilt show pines from the judge amidst the laughter and acclamations of beholders. With this, the public sports concluded, and as evening was drawing on pace, such of the guests as were not invited to pass the night within the tower to their departure, while shortly afterwards supper being served in the banqueting hall on a scale of profusion and magnificence quite equal to the earlier repast, the king and the whole of his train sat down to it.